ठीक है ना सर को मित्र सर को बोलता हूँ एक सेकंड एक सेकंड बताइए आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल दी पार्टिसिपेंट्स टू काइंडली म्यूट दम सेल्स काइंडली म्यूट दम सेल्स आपका नाम क्या है Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We will start the webinar. So, on behalf of uh, Indian Nuclear Society, I extend warm greetings to Professor B. Uh, Venkatraman, Director I. G. K. and i also welcome all the honorable participants and honorable members of indian nuclear society i once again appeal to all the participants to kindly mute themselves uh i must uh, certainly mention here that i contacted uh, professor venkatraman on exactly on the third day he took the responsibility of director i think car and in spite of his intense schedule just on account of his respect to indian nuclear society he agreed to give a talk on the subject हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल ओके वेल वॉट आई वॉज सेंग इज दैट इज ए वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एक्टिविटी टू इन्फॉर्म योर फ्रेंड्स एंड ऑल्सो थ्रू यू द जनरल पब्लिक फॉर द रेलिवेंस ऑफ अटामिक एनर्जी and it is important in the indian development it is with this background the ins conducted our four seminar earlier webinar earlier with the eminent experts on the subject and uh, we attach great importance to this activity today we are in the process of reactivating our uh, webinar activity to presentation by an eminent speaker i'm very happy to have dr bala subramanian venkat raman and many of you must be aware that he has recently taken charge of the i indian nuclear i dictat 
and also bhavnik. The technology is the key in our long-term utilization. The fast technology, fast reactive technology is very important for our uh, future development and dependence on our own resources and energy production. And this just allow me to recall the services of our earlier directors of IJCAR, particularly that of the N. Srinivasan, Sri Pranjpe, Dr. Balvev Raj, and others, who have dedicated their personal life for the establishment of this center. Dr. Venkat Raman, as a member of the IJCAR, has more than 35 years' experience and his research and development is an important area where his knowledge and basic sciences has to lead important innovation in the field of non destructive testing. And presentation is a very important and application of nuclear science that a glimpses into the application of ionizing and non-ionizing radiation and undating. I understand that his such work has been effective many important areas, and he had made contribution not only to the Department of Atomic Energy, but to ISRO, the DRDO, and DMRL, and other units that come there. And I think it is a very, in space also, it is very heartening to have him to deliver a lecture on this project. As a physicist, Wilker Raman has been focused on the applied such and development related to radiation sciences and technology. Uh, and you will hear much more from my colleague, Dr. Raman Mohdi, who will give you detailed background of the achievement of Dr. Wilker Raman. He's a senior professor at the, at the Ami Baba National Institute has guided a number of PhD students and the recipient of the DA Homi Baba Science and Technology Award in 2007. He is well recognized and honored in his field nationally and internationally. I am extremely happy that Dr. Venkat Brahman accepted our invitation to deliver the lecture and my sincere thanks to him and wish him all the best. Thank you. You are invited to observe Good afternoon. Now it's my pleasant duty to uh, inform the quorum about the profile of Dr. B. Venkatraman. Dr. Balasubramanam Venkatraman, born in Tiruchirappalli, did his final schooling at Kendriya Vidyalaya Kalpakam. He then did his pre-university in National College, Trichy, and B.Sc. and M.Sc. in Physics from St. Joseph's College, Tiruchirappalli, uh, which is affiliated to Madras University, during 1978-1983. He joined the 27th batch of B.A.R.C. training school at Mumbai in 1983, and on successful completion, was posted at the Radio Metallurgy Laboratory, IGCAR, Kalpakam, in 1984. With a research career spanning 37 years, he has combined the physics of non-destructive evaluation, NDE, with engineering and technology, and consistently provided excellent R&D support and robust NDE-based NDE -based solutions to technologically challenging problems in the nuclear and other strategic and core industries. His significant milestone activities for nuclear industry include procedures for X-ray and neutron radiography of highly irradiated fuel pins, comprehensive NDE for evaluation of tube to sheet, uh, welds of PFBR steam generator, radiometric testing of shielding structures. He has been primarily responsible for establishing the conventional and digital X-ray, neutron radiography, and thermal imaging facilities at IGCAR. 
He was part of the DAE team to review the queuing aspects of KKNPP 1 and 2. For the strategic industries, the significant activities in which he had been associated include standardizing multi NDE techniques on evaluation and life extension of tail rotor blades of MI 8 and MI 17 defense helicopters, training of over 100 IAF personnel in NDE and review of QA welding procedures and NDE methods during fabrication of rocket motor casing using DMR 1700 alloy. His expertise had also been utilized by ISRO for solving challenging NDE problems pertaining to the initial PSLV and GSLV qualification of TI 6AL 4V alloy satellite gas bottles and earth sensors of insight. He developed the neutron radiography procedure for examination of pyro devices using Kamenry reactor. As a physicist, he has focused on applied R&D related to radiation sciences and technology and infrared thermography. He has pioneered the application of IO, IR thermography for deformation studies, online weld monitoring and early detection of breast cancer. One of the unique applications of Dr. Venkatraman's science and technology knowledge base has been the use of NDE methodologies and techniques for the benefit of Indian art, archaeology, and artifacts of national heritage. He had been instrumental in the development and application of conventional and advanced NDE methods based on radiography and X-ray fluorescence for the characterization and fingerprinting of ancient South Indian bronzes. Dr. Venkatraman has also made an in-depth study into the ancient method of lost wax process used for casting such bronzes. The expertise and experience thus gained has successfully applied during the fabrication of the tallest Nataraja in the world, which was gifted by DAE to CERN in June 2004. Recently, he was part of the investigation team in Tamil Nadu for the identification of fake icons had also been invited by Mysore Palace authorities to investigate the gold leaf paintings and by ASI for the evaluation of colostrums of Brihadeshwara Temple, Tanjavur. Dr. Venkatraman is the recipient of the DAE Homi Baba Science and Technology Award 2007 for Individual Excellence and Group Achievement Awards of DAE during 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16. He is the recipient of the INS Gold Medal 2005 ISNT NDT Man of the Year 2001, D&H Sherion Award 1993, ISNT International Recognition 2013, IIW Sharp Tools Award 2011, and has won more than 10 Best Paper Awards. He has been invited to deliver many keynote, plenary, and invited talks in national and international seminars, including the Asian Pacific Conference on NDTE. He was a visiting scientist at the Fraunhofer Institute of NDT during 2006-2007. He is honorary fellow of the Indian Society for Non-Destructive Testing, fellow of Chennai Academy of Sciences, executive board member Asian Pacific Federation of NDT, past president 14th Asian Pacific Conference on NDT, past chairman quantitative infrared thermography Asian Subcommittee, President Indian Society for Non-Destructive Testing, President Indian Association of Radiation Protection, President American Society for NDT, India Section, and so on. He has over 300 publications in journals and conferences, including two articles in Encyclopedia of Material Science, two monographs, three books, and is the series editor along with Dr. Baldev Raj for the ND2 handbooks published by NCB ISNT. He is presently a distinguished scientist and director, safety, quality, and resource management group, and director, engineering services group at IGCAR. He is also a senior professor in HBNI and has guided five students for their PhD and is presently guiding three students. He succeeds Dr. A.K. Madhuri as Director IGCAR and Director GSO. On behalf of INS, we congratulate him 
for uh, reaching this uh, 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 this uh, huge milestone. And now it is my pleasure and privilege to invite him to kindly commence his talk. Thank you very much, sir. At the outset, I'm deeply thankful to the department for entrusting me with this privileged position of Director IGCR and uh, Director GSO and respected Sri Metaji, EC members of Indian Nuclear Society and all the distinguished participants and delegates who are online today. So let me start. I hope my screen is visible. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And my screen is also visible, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. So I thought that, okay, when- Please use full, full screen, please, full screen. Yeah, it is full screen. I'm on full screen now. I don't think so. Uh, I Yeah. But You're able to see screen now. Yeah. Okay. So at the I mean at the outset, I'm grateful to INS for giving me this particular opportunity. And when Dr. Ramarov asked me, well, initially I thought that I would talk about IGCR, etc. But then NDE has always been favorite to me, and I chose this particular topic of ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, specifically ionizing radiations, for two reasons. One is, it is 125 years since the discovery of X-rays. And this is the 125th year since the discovery of radioactivity by Henry Becquerel, way back in 1986. That was one of the reasons. And the second reason is, it is the Department of Atomic Energy which has pioneered the applications of ionizing radiations within the country. And not only that, even in the field of non-destructive evaluation, which I feel in my perspective, plays a very important and catalytic role, not only in the strategic sectors and the core sectors, ensuring quality and safety, but also in the society in a variety of form. So I thought that let me take up this particular area, highlight a few select applications of ionizing radiations in IGCAR pertaining to the nuclear components only. I'm not going to touch upon the societal aspects because I thought that will dilute. And at the end, I have a few thoughts also, which I thought I can put it forward to INS and to the community as a whole. So with this, uh, the outline of my talk is something like this. A pers my perspective of non-destructive evaluation, a few case studies pertaining to fuel fabrication, post-irradiation examination, component inspection, non-ionizing radiations based on infrared thermography is a nascent area still within the department where I feel that a lot of applications are possible and it needs to be applied. One societal application, which I cherish, and some of my thoughts. Okay, just today, NDT is indispensable and an integral part of engineering, technology, and society. In fact, it would not be a tall claim to say that it has been catalytic for a better quality of life in the society. You name a field, and you will see that NDT is directly and indirectly associated with that. I'll not go into the details, but my perspective of NDE is that it is a key input factor that decides when a component can be put into service and when it can be retired. I always have a comparison between humans and the components. Well, if you take a human being, I say that right from the fetus to the grave in the healthcare cycle, 
NDE is indispensable. Non-invasive modalities are indispensable. When we have the fetus in the mother's womb, we use ultrasound at the third week, fifth week, seventh week, ninth week to ensure that the fetus is good, it is growing healthily, etc. And when you have the child that is born and then it starts playing, it falls down, etc. You take it to a doctor. He, he or she subjects it to x-rays to ensure that there are no fractures. Etc. And above 40, all of us become health conscious. So we subject ourselves to annual medical examination, which comprises of, again, ultrasound, x-rays, CT, angiograms, MRI, etc. And as our problems increase with old age, all these modalities come into picture at various stages of life till we retire from the world. In the technological parlance in industries, if you just see, you have the design to retirement concept in engineering infrastructure. When we talk about ingots, again, for defect, detecting the piping defects, you use visual inspection, you use ultrasound, etc. When we talk of fabrication, the casting, the welding, the component fabrication. In all these cases, NDE is an in indispensable part. If you take welding, for example, right from welder's qualification to welding qualification to process qualification and its applications, NDE gets applied in various forms. And once the component is pressed into service, during pre-service, you do the baseline NDE to establish the parameters. During in-service, you do the NDE again to see that there are no defects which are growing and which can pose a problem. And once the component attains 30 to 40 years of service, you just check to see whether there is limited life in that so that the component life can be extended. Again, here, NDT plays a very crucial role. So whether it is the healthcare or the industry, right from the fetus to grave or design to retirement, NDE is an indispensable part. If you talk about the industry in the 21st century, we have various parameters that determine its efficiency and also its utility. Energy, I have just put certain arrows which indicate the role of NDE and the number of arrows indicate the involvement and intensity of NDE. So if you see here, the new processes, today we have a host of new materials which are coming in, which requires stringency of specifications. We have new processes which are coming up, new performance goals and shorter cycle of development in all these cases, and also the life cycle management. The intensity and role of NDE is quite intense. When you talk about the health in the 21st century, Cost of health care depends on the imaging modalities. Early detection depends again on NDE. Today, they talk on multimodal NDE for early detection. Reliability and diagnosis and telediagnosis. In all these cases, NDE plays a crucial role. When you come to NDE in the nuclear fuel cycle, you cannot name an area where NDE is not getting utilized. Right from uranium prospecting, where you use electromagnetic sensors for ore prospecting, up to reprocessing and also waste management, NDE plays a very crucial role. I have just listed some of the NDE techniques at the various stages, say fuel production, in the in pre-service and in-service inspection, aging management, spent fuel, etc. And today, when we talk of the major issue of extending the life from 40 years to 60 years or more, NDE is going to play a very crucial role in providing the key input to the designers who, based on the fracture mechanic concepts, etc., can decide on the remnant life assessment. Well, I come from the Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, Kalpakam, the second largest R&D institution of the Department of Atomic Energy, where we have the first fast beta test reactor based on a unique uranium carbide and plutonium carbide fuel which has successfully seen a burn-off of about 165 gigawatt days per ton. And we have successfully processed uh, fuel 
which has been irradiated up to around 155 gigawatt days in our coral plant and more than about 60 campaigns have been successfully undertaken in this particular plant. I'm not going to touch upon the details of in these particular areas. Kalpakam is a very unique complex internationally because it is here we have three different kinds of reactor systems. When you say reactor system, three different kinds of reactors utilizing the three fissile elements. We have the Madras Atomic Power Station using based on the natural uranium. We have the fast beta test reactor based on uranium carbide and plutonium carbide. And we have the Kalpaka mini reactor, the only probably working reactor in the world with using uranium-233 as the fuel. So this is a very unique complex internationally. And today, the mandate of the department, which has been given to me, is primarily focusing on the commissioning of the prototype fast beta reactor and also taking the fast beta test reactor at Kalpakam to the 40 megawatts, which is the rated capacity. Just to, I will be focusing on, I will not be focusing fully on POBR, just to give you a glimpse of POBR because I'll be touching on some of the NDE that has been undertaken on some of these components. We have the main vessel, we have the core support structure, and we have a number of uh, what you call as the in-core components. And we also have the out-of-core components like the steam generator, etc. The main characteristics of POBR, of course, is it's a 500 megawatts pool type of reactor using sodium as a coolant and uh, the uranium oxide, plutonium oxide as the fuel. These are the other things. Okay, when you talk of NDE, when I talk of nuclear components vis-a-vis -vis the industrial components, the nuclear components have a slightly, uh, they are placed at a slight disadvantage compared to the industrial components. While the industrial components would only see the pressure and temperature in the nuclear part, especially the in-core components, these are going to be subjected to the intense gamma and neutron irradiations, which can alter the mechanical properties and subsequently the remnant life also. So in this particular case, the designers, the nuclear designers taking this into account have ensured the stringency of specifications, which exceeds the conventional codal practices, which are normally available internationally like you have the ASMB boiler and pressure vessel code. Just a brief comparison. We have the section three, class one, which pertains to nuclear components. You can see here that in case of the nuclear components pertaining to the fast beta, uh, prototype fast beta reactor, we have tightened the specifications with re respect to defects, linear defects, as well as the elongated or the rounded defects. So making it more stringent, this means that we are expecting technologies that would be much more advanced, much more capable of detecting these sort of defects in the materials in the shop floor. This is the main vessel, which is the largest vessel in the PFBR. It's going to hold about 1100 tons of sodium. It is uh, roughly about 13 meters in height and about 12 meters in diameter. We have very stringent specifications which were laid out and which has been successfully met by the manufacturers. And in this particular case, I'm not going into the details of the NDE that was performed. Radiographic testing based on ionizing radiations played a major part because we have wells running to a, a few kilometers in total, which has been examined by radiography and wherever radiography was not accessible, ultrasonic testing was used and liquid penetration, uh, penetrant of course, and most important, the regulators insisted that after the vessel is fabricated, it should be subjected to integrity testing by the helium leak test, which we performed successfully on the entire part of the belt, ensuring its integrity. Just to give you a glimpse into the wells, we have different well configurations in this particular case. We had dissimilar wells also, and wells with varying thicknesses. And all these things have been successfully examined by radiographic testing with a sensitivity level of the order of around 2-1-T, which is much more stringent than the ASME or the RCCMR. And as I said, 100% well helium leak testing was performed to qualify this particular vessel uh, very well. So this is a glimpse of the vessel at, as it was being lowered into the reactor vault. We were involved 
in the optical alignment of this particular vessel with respect to the support structures, which was done successfully. I was here somewhere along with our team. This was done in Bhavini at that particular time. Fine. Coming back, this is as far as the reactor core part of it is concerned. Just to give you an example of an out of core component, the steam generator is considered to be the workhorse in any power plant, be it a nuclear power plant or a thermal power plant. In this particular case, the steam generator of the prototype fast beta reactor is quite unique because, and it's also critical. The reason is we have sodium on one side and we have the water also. And as all of us are aware, any failure of the well, especially the tube to tube sheet wells leading to sodium water interaction can be quite catastrophic. And so we had a very stringent requirement with respect to the concave concavity and convexity or the defects that can be permitted in this sort of welding. Now the designers had modified this particular well so that in the conventional case of steam generators, we, we normally have a fillet well. But in this particular case, we had a small butt well where we had the sp uh, spigot to which the tube was butt welded. So this was a modification and they wanted 100% examination by NDE. So we suggested new, uh, microfocal radiography and why I thought I should point out this is, this also led to the introduction of microfocal technology in the country. We started the technology development way back in the 1990s. And one of the, I mean, when a small tube sheet was made in our central workshop, and we were asked to develop the procedure for the NDE part of it, we faced a very peculiar problem. The moment I, introduced my rod anode, which as you can see here, inside the tube sheet, I found that I'm not getting any image at all. But the moment I removed the rod anode out and I had a normal tube inserted, I could take an X-ray radiograph and clearly get the image. This was a bit puzzling and nowhere in the international literature, we had come across such a situation. As a physicist, then I went into a little bit of analysis. I measured the radiation levels. Once I put the probe, uh, uh, microfocal probe inside the tube, energize it, see what is the radiation levels outside. I got a good image. When I introduced it into the tube sheet and again, I measured it, I found that the radiation levels fell down and there was no image. So this set me thinking and going into how X-rays were being generated I found that, okay, normally X-rays, you have a beam of electrons, which are accelerated, which fall on a tungsten target, and then you have the emission of the X-rays. So in this particular case, I could deduce that the electrons are getting accelerated, but there is some mechanism by which the electrons are not hitting the target, but probably they are hitting the walls of the new metal uh, tube, which is causing radiation to come out, but I'm not getting an image. So this led us to investigate further and we observed for the first time that the process of welding introduces magnetism, residual magnetism, which deflects the electron beam, causing it to deviate from the target. So consequently, we searched materials that can insulate the probe from the tube sheet part of it we hit upon the new metal concept and this technology was suggested to the manufacturer of the X-ray tube. Subsequently, new metal rod anodes became available in the market. So we suggested this to an international manufacturer who subsequently produced new metal rod anodes, which were subsequently used during the actual fabrication of the tube to tube sheet wells in the steam generator of PFBR at Larsen and Tubro. So this is to highlight that how an underpinning of science can be beneficial in tackling the shop flow for our problems also. So this is a typical radiograph. I'm not going into the details because I have presented this n number of times. We could achieve a sensitivity of 32 micrometers. First time in the history, we could detect crater cracks and we could also detect concavity and convexity to the order of around 20 micrometers. But when the thing got translated into the shop flow after technology development, in the shop floor, we faced a unique problem. 
because we were using a rod anode in which the X-ray beam was coming out at, in, at an angle because of the shorter distances, there was a variation in the density that was occurring on the radiogram. Now, as per the code of practice, I cannot have a radiation density vary more than about minus 15% to plus 30%. And here the density variation was of the order of around 50%. Then Mr. N.V. Bagley, who was the general manager at Larsen and Tube Group, came up with a unique solution that why not we have a wedge so we worked upon using the concepts of modeling and radiation attenuation based on, again, Monte Carlo simulations, et cetera. We worked upon this wedge, the curvature of the wedge and the thickness to be adopted, gave it to the shop floor people and Mr. Bagley could easily translate it, fit it up in the shop floor and subsequently nine steam generators, each having about 1100 wells were successfully examined and today it has also been installed. Well, this is a case of an example in a large size component. When I have components like a thermocouple, which is an indispensable part of instrumentation in any reactor or in any industry, thermocouples come with their own problems. In nuclear reactors, sheet thermocouples are used extensively. We wanted to promote an Ind I mean, Indian manufacturer because earlier we have been importing all these thermocouples from abroad. And the performance of the imported thermocouples was excellent. But when the Indian manufacturer supplied this, we observed that these thermocouples were failing at higher temperatures. And the response times was also not quite adequate. So we again used microfocal and high definition radiography to image this 0.5 millimeters and 1 millimeter thermocouple, which was a real challenge. And when we went up to ASTM standard, they advocated radiography, but here again, we used high definition radiography combined with image processing to see what is the quality of the junction well. And we found that in the Indian thermocouples, this quality of the junction well was not proper. And the distance between the junction well and the tip, which determines the response time, was also quite large. The filling was not adequate. These feedback was given to the manufacturers and subsequently, what we did was we also wrote to ASTM Standards Committee on the ad advocating the use of image processing, which can aid in uh, the interpretation of such radiographs, either film-based or digital-based. And subsequently, ASTM in, in its revised versions added this particular image processing concepts also to the standard methods of evaluation. So this again, the feedback to the manufacturer was very useful. He improved upon the quality. And in that way, we were happy that we could develop an Indian manufacturer capable of supplying some thermocouples to the nuclear industry. The fuel is one of the crux in any nuclear reactor. And the PFBR fuel, which is again a combination of MOX, uranium and plutonium, needs special attention. This fuel has been fabricated by BRC, the AFFF, the Advanced Fuel Fabrication Facility. So these slides I had taken from Dr. Joe Spanakal. So here again, we have certain requirements as far as the end plug welding is concerned. It should be free of lack of penetration, lack of uh, fusion, and porosity should be minimum, including inclusions. So this necessitated what is called as a shape correction block, which they fabricated, and then microdensitometry was done. And again here, advanced techniques like image processing was done. Incidentally, I can definitely say with confidence that DAE is an institution where advanced imaging methodologies had been put. In fact, we were the first to pioneer the application of X-ray sensitive VDCon in the industry for the evaluation of thermocouples and also electronic components. So here, again, this is a shape correction block which was designed by AFFF and successfully incorporated for uh, the evaluation of the wells. And for the first time, real-time motion radiography was introduced in DAE by the Tarapur team, which was successfully incorporated, qualified, and the fuel pins examined quite successfully. These are the typical images of the end plug belt and also of the fuel pins because they came up with a very novel idea of combining X-radiography and autoradiography to detect the defects 
the plutonium agglomerates and also to ensure that the there is no sort of mix up of the fuel pins that can occur with varying uh, compositions so we had two different compositions and using gamma scanning this it had been ensured that it is meeting the requirements quite successfully so this is again a unique development and this also was the first time when real time inspection techniques advanced inspection techniques were involved well once a fuel is put inside the reactor and you need to see whether the, when the fuel is being used for the first time the designer's criteria are being met or not whether the fuel is performing as per the re design requirements in the case of the abtr fuel this was a challenge because the uranium carbide and plutonium carbide fuel was being used for the first time so aerb insisted that once the fuel reaches 25000 megawatt days burner then it should be removed and you should ensure that there is adequate design margins with respect to the fuel clad gap the integrity of the fuel etc the fuel was removed from abtr after 25000 megawatt days it was taken to the radio metallurgy laboratory adjacent to our abtr and now how do you examine a highly irradiated fuel neutron radiography is a solution but in the 1990s there was neutron radiography was not available at kalpakam the kamini reactor which was being de designed by brc uh, all of us know that uh, dr pashupati mc nivasan were involved it was under design and it was under installation and commissioning so then how do you go about it so at that time we hit upon a novel idea of using x rays itself but this was a great challenge the fuel pin itself would be emitting radiations gamma radiations and if i want to use the x rays to have a good signal to noise ratio the intensity of my x radiation should be at least 3 to 4 times higher than the intensity of radiations coming out of the irradiated fuel so i devised upon a methodology which had to be implemented in the hot cell so i measured the intensity of radiations using our health physics colleagues by using the primary ionization chambers the intensity of radiation coming out of x ray tube then using the thermoluminescence dosimeters that were available here we measured what is the radiation intensity coming out accordingly we designed the radiographic parameters based on the exposure time we optimized on the ex exposure time of the order of around 1 to 1 and 1/2 minutes which was very challenging the fuel pin had to be introduced in that time imaged and then it had to be withdrawn so the entire thing was conceived implemented at the back of a hot cell and when the images were taken we got excellent images and when we presented this to the aerb neither aerb nor the peers at that time at brc were willing to accept the fact because internationally radiography of irradiated components using x rays had never been reported and it was never thought feasible a team led by late dr jk ghosh came over to kalpaka and when they examined the entire sequence of events we also demonstrated to them taking the actual radiographs they were convinced that this methodology is feasible and subsequently till today this methodology has been ad adopted quite successfully for the irradiation this is where again an underpinning of basic science with the requirements can help in evolving good solutions so here you see the irradiated mox fuel irradiated up to 112 gigawatt days using x ray radiography you can see the clarity of the images and you can also see that fine features can be easily detected in this sort of radiographs and of course we went on to commission the kamini reactor and i was responsible in fact to take the first neutron radiograph using the kamini reactor subsequently again here i should mention that i had the wisdom of dande from brc who guided me on setting up this entire facility here and subsequently we were able to successfully take the neutron radiographs pertaining to fuel pins the control rods etc this you can see is a typical neutron radiograph of a fuel pin well in any 
nuclear facility shielding is a very important aspect the shielding is in the form of uh, concrete structures lead casks etc so here again radiometry where you use a source of radiation and use a detector to see that uh, the intensity of radiations is commensurate with what is expected is met we have examined very complex structures here we have always taken the help of monte carlo methods to first model this entire process see what is the sort of dose requirements that would be there accordingly for the first time in the history we have used the high grade the high intensity sources cobalt 60 sources of the order of around 100 curies to investigate the shielding integrity of the hot cells and also for the other structures so this has been done quite successfully and today we would like to propose it as a standard to the bureau of indian standards so that we have a is we have a is standard which later on we would like to take it up to iso also for standardization well when you talk this is as far as shielding is concerned but when you come to reprocessing we have a number of okay nde which has been quite applied successfully during the initial stages of uh, the piping evaluation etc i'll come to that later but we had a very peculiar problem of the centri uh, centrifugal bowls there was a choking in this particular bowl and our designers wanted to know the nature of the choking the extent of the choking let us remember that all the centrifugal bowls had a very high activity in the case of an irradiated fuel my activity level was of the order of around 1000 r per hour here it was about 80 r per hour and so what we did this we did a little bit of decontamination part of it but we could not reduce the doses to below about 4 r per hour so we had to design a nde methodology by which i can look into this bowl see where are the areas that are getting blocked and also i need to ascertain the nature of the isotopes that is there within this particular bowl so here we designed a unique setup this is an indigenously set up uh, uh, system which had both uh, emission and transmission tomography and also you can do compton backscatter, backscatter radiography in this particular system so here what we did is we kept this and for the first time we got a gamma tomography done which could clearly reveal the extent of blockage and also by emission tomography this is by transmission tomography and this is again by emission tomography we could determine what are the isotopes the feedback given to the designers was helpful in identifying methodologies by which this could be taken out and then it could be reused today this is a routine procedure that is being adopted in our reprocessing plant coral for the centrifugal balls. Well, this is as far as our, uh, the reprocessing is concerned. I thought I'll just take a classical example. When you come to the actual fabrication of components, especially in large plants like the fast reactor fuel cycle facility, which involves huge amount of piping running to kilometers, more than about 100 kilometers, and then we have large number of welded pipes, then advanced NDE technologies are to be used. Our industries are normally not geared to that. And when we put this condition that, okay, you need to use digital radiography, there was a lot of resistance from the industry. But ultimately, we could convince them that, look, it will be cost effective for you rather than the conventional film radiography. And not only that, you can do the inspections with the required quality in a faster period of time. So we introduced digital radiography. This was again in an industry, um, I think in Tarapur, where we had to examine, this is for the fast reactor fuel cycle facilities. We had a total of roughly about uh, 4,500 meters of welded pipes. That is each pipe uh, had was made with the ODs ranging from 200 to 762 millimeters and thickness of four to eight here. A plate is going to be bent and it is going to be welded in the longitudinal, not the cell seam, in the L seam. Each weld was roughly about six meters. And if I had to do conventional film radiography, imagine the amount of time. So here again, we qualified the real-time system based on duplex penetrometers, 
established the procedure, made it acceptable as per the code of practice, and subsequently all these pipes have been examined successfully using this particular and the uh, the uh, uh, the inspection could be completed within the stipulated time schedules. The in this particular case, the manufacturer appreciated the use of digital radiography, and today we can say with pride that the industry has more than about three real-time systems, realizing the importance of the benefit of doing real-time radiography. This again is a forging. And in the traditional way, this is again for the fast reactor fuel cycle facility. We had roughly about 15,000 forgings to be examined. These are of various sizes and then types. And normally, ultrasonic examination is recommended. But then if I had to do a conventional ultrasonic examination, it was going to take me more than a year or one and a half for the entire examination of all these components. So we hit upon the idea of using again radiography instead of ultrasonics and we established the procedure for this. Again, the radiographic techniques in all these cases, there was again a lot of resistance from the manufacturer, but with a little bit of cajoling and a little bit of forcing, we did it and we could successfully examine all these things using the radiography and real-time radiography also. Similarly here, again, castings are a troublesome area where ultrasonics is a bit difficult due to the coarse nature of the castings. So radiography is normally employed. In this particular case, this is for the manipulators that are going to be used in the fast reactor fuel cycle facility. When these castings were radiographed, there were a number of indications that were obtained. Uh, we had roughly about 675 numbers of aluminum castings and 1256 numbers of stainless steel castings. So when the initial lot was produced and it was examined by radiography, these sort of indications had come and straight away all the castings were rejected. But the manufacturer was quite stubborn in saying that these castings have been produced as per a process by which defects cannot be uh, what you call expected. But our inspectors felt that all these are defects. The matter was referred to me and then we investigated it. Going back into history, way back in the 1990s, we had received uh, gas turbine blades from the GTRA and these were made by investment casting where you had long grains. We had two types of blades, one made by the investment casting process and one a coarse grain blade. So in both the cases, when we did microfocal radiography again for the first time in the country, and then that technology was subsequently introduced in GTRE, we introduced, we encountered the problems of what you call as spurious lines, which by, okay, if you go back in physics, when you have a single crystal and you have X-rays impinging on it, it is quite possible that because of Bragg's consideration, a certain wavelength of this polychromatic X-ray can fulfill the Bragg's criteria and get deflected. So this is going to produce what is called as a Cosal line or a Kikuchi line, depending on what the nature of the grain size. So this we had encountered. We had at that time got a glimpse into this. So I thought that this could be because of that. So what we did was we varied the energy of radiation because of which we observed that some of these things disappeared and demonstrated to the inspectors that look, this is a problem because of the coarse grain nature of the material and it is not a defect. To instill confidence, a material was also cut and it was observed that this was not a defect. It was purely a metallurgical processes, a process. So in this way, we could convince our inspectors also and then educate them future when they encounter this sort of problem, this, it could be resolved successfully. Well, this is just a glimpse of the application of ionizing radiations during service and just before service also and during the production part of it. Well, I'm also passionate about uh, the uh, non-ionizing radiations. When you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, you have a range of electromagnetic radiations, starting from the gamma rays on one hand, the X-rays, 
the ultraviolet, the visible, and the infrared. Infrared radiations hold a lot of potential, especially all of you would be aware that in this COVID case, in this COVID scenario, or earlier when we had the H1N1 or the swine flu, etc. In all the airports, you used to have a thermal scanner, which used to determine the thermal profiles of the individuals. So this can be applied. That is the condition monitoring of the individual. And today, condition monitoring in the industries using thermal imaging is a well-established fact. But I'm not going into that particular part of it. Thermal imaging can be used for very specialized problem. For example, in the case of a mixer settler, again, in our demonstration fuel reprocessing plant, we had a unique I mean, uh, situation where in the mixer settler, there were leaks and because of a large number of small leaks, HLT was finding it very difficult to detect the leaks. So at that time, we thought about why not use infrared thermography? What is the concept? All of us are well aware of the Joule Thomson effect. When a gas from a narrow orifice expands, there is a process of cooling. So this was adopted successfully and we could determine the leaks very successfully and subsequently all the leaks were rectified. Today, thermal imaging can be used for coating characterization. In fact, for the nickel boron coatings, where the coatings are of the order of around few micrometers, 10 to 20 micrometers or 30 micrometers, where it is very difficult for me to use ultrasonic. Again, I have to use immersion ultrasonics. Thermal imaging can be used to characterize this particular area. In fact, for during the process qualification of the overlays, columnar overlays, we could use thermography very effectively because it not only offered the possibility of detection of the deaddition or the delaminations, but it was a whole field process wherein the entire component could be investigated by me. So this had been, I mean, this methodology had been standardized. Similarly, corrosion detection is also possible as well as intergranular stress corrosion cracking can also be determined because if I use lock-in thermography, which is an advanced variant of thermography wherein I allow the incoming thermal waves to interfere with the thermal wave that is going to be reflected from the defects, then using the interferometric principles, it is possible for me to have the phase angle calculations, which is an indicator of the uh, intergranular stress corrosion cracking. So this has just been initiated and we can use it. Of course, we are using it for the leak before break also. This I would come at a later stage where concepts like infrared imaging coupled with the digital image correlation can be used to validate the design exper I mean, experimentally. So this is what I was talking about. We can use thermal imaging for defect characterization, coating characterization come, uh, very well, and this has been quite standardized. In the field of materials characterization, thermal imaging holds a lot of promise. All of us know that as materials deform, roughly about 80% of the energy is dissipated as heat energy and the balance is going to be dissipated as exoelectrons or acoustic emissions, etc. So if I'm able to capture this heat energy and also thermally profile it, it is possible for me to predict before the zone of deformation and then the zone of fracture also. So we, are, we have combined thermal imaging and a lot of uh, studies have been done on uh, this we could clearly delineate the thermoelastic effect also. And also we could, combining it with artificial intelligence, predict through a combination of experiments, the zone of fracture and the point at which it is going to fracture. We have also combined plastic, I mean, uh, advanced imaging techniques like digital image correlation with the thermal imaging to understand the mechanism of Luder's band. In fact, this was a PhD thesis topic of one of the students, uh, of our students who had successfully done this. And today he is a DSC inspired faculty at IIT Kanpur. Well, this is a collaborative work with the BRC where we had used micro scale thermography for the characterization of micro machine, micro hot plates for the development of chemi resistive gas sensors. 
which were being developed by the electronics division, BRC. And we could also use it successfully. See, in any neutronics, uh, when you want to see complex PCBs and the areas of failure, this is a very potential technique, which was used for the neutronics of Kamini reactor. So we energized it, and the point of failure could be clearly delineated by the thermal profiles, where in all the other cases, we had the normal thermal profiles. There was the abnormal thermal profile with a localized heating, which could be clearly delineated and the fault could also be attended. Similarly, corrosion could also be determined quite comfortably with thermal imaging techniques. This particular technique holds a lot of promise, but it needs to be exploited both by the designers and the NDE personnel. So just to give you an example today, we are working for the use of thermal imaging and computer tomography in a multimodal way for these are the uh, what you call the wheels of the uh, prototype Arjun Martel battle tank that is being developed by CVRD. They are thinking of composite wheels. So in this particular case, the delaminations can be very effectively detected by thermal imaging, whereas computer tomography can help me to reveal other defects, etc. I'm not going into the other societal or the other applications because I thought I will focus on this and we are already running short of time. This is again another classical example of the use of thermal imaging for the canopy of fighter aircrafts. So we were to qualify the processes which was being developed at uh, uh, Ojar Nasik of the Hindustan Aeronautics Limited and this again was done quite successfully. Well, in any plant, be it the fast reactor fuel cycle facility or uh, a nuclear reactor or the reprocessing plants, etc. Knowledge and asset management is very, very essential. What do I mean by this? Today, we have a host of softwares and technologies available that allows me to integrate all the data pertaining to pre-service inspection, the characteristics of the component, the baseline performance of these characteristics, the design requirements, etc. And I can also factor in the internet experiences. If all these things can be combined together, we would have an excellent asset management for that particular component, which can serve as a sort of what you call very essential document when I have to talk about remnant life assessment. So we started for our DFRP, Demonstration uh, Fuel Reprocessing Plant, which has kilometers of piping, high density piping. And we have more than roughly about 70,000 wells. We have 70,000 radiographic exposures and all these things. So we have developed a small asset and knowledge management system which archives the documents, the records, the drawings, the inspection reports. And it is something like what you call. We also did what is called as a Six Sigma analysis of during when the uh, DFRP was getting commissioned, commissioned in the sense that the piping process was in an advanced stage because this is high density piping. Welding of the pipes was a very, very challenging task. And it had to be done in certain positions, 4G, etc., which was quite difficult. So based on the initial trials and the initial radiographic examinations, we did a Six Sigma analysis to see the nature of the joint repairs that are coming out. And we observed that during this particular process, we formed the Pareto charts. We found that the lack of penetration is one of the main important defects that is contributing, followed by oxidation. So this helped us to see what measures can be implemented on the field. One is giving a rigorous training for the welders. Second thing is to appropriately modify the purging techniques so that the process of oxidation can be eliminated and this we could do it very very successfully and today we have started on this knowledge management where we now have a software which encompasses all these learnings and if i go to a particular line tap on it tap on that particular bell it will give me the complete history of that particular bell and what sort of in inspections it has undergone the status of the belt, etc. So when I do periodic inspections and update these records, at the end of about 30 or 40 years, when the designers or the regulators want full-fledged data, I would have the complete history. This sort of approach 
probably can be done in a harmonized way within the various DAE units and it can be adopted not only for the piping but also for important reactor components which I feel is a gap area. Well, any successful nuclear technology requires a validated design, a focused interdisciplinary approach, it requires proven manufacturing technologies, a very robust inspection and QA, reliable sensors, safe operation procedures, and systematic and planned in-service inspection, life assessment, and also knowledge management. And in all these cases, a crucial link is non-destructive evaluation because validation of design can be done by NDE. To take a classical example, I still remember when our PFBR, when there were some experimental investigations being done, they wanted to see the thermal ratcheting part of it. So a small experimental facility was designed in the structural mechanics laboratory. And at that time, the then group director wanted to know whether they used to do it by modeling purposes, but they wanted to know whether we can determine the thermal profiles experimentally. So we use thermography to determine online what are the thermal profiles generated during the ratcheting experiment, which went on to modify the design, the input parameters that were being used and refine the models that were also being used. Similarly, when we talk about the leak before break criteria, we combined thermal imaging with time of flight diffraction. Time of flight diffraction gives me the tip of the crack, which I could detect it very comfortably. Whereas by thermal image, I could not only determine the extent of the defect, but thermal image also helps me, especially lock-in thermography, to determine the zone of plastic deformation. So this could be used very, very successfully and give inputs to the designers. So this is as far as design is concerned, but then manufacturing technologies, I've already, already inspired. All the other things I've already indicated through the examples. If you see the history of NDE, if you take the physical basis of all NDE are the theories by Herschel, Maxwell, Tongen, Faraday, etc. And these theories were developed right from the 18th century onwards up to the 20th century. We had a technological transformation in the early 20th century. In fact, if you just go back into history, it is the explosion of the boilers which led to the formulation of the ASME boiler and pressure vessel codes. And radiography was one of the first NDE methods that was used in the industry to visually see what are the defects. And this was followed by the oil and whitening method, which we call as a liquid penetrant testing today. Initial NDE was quite qualitative and NDE came into being, being applied as a qualitative inspection tool right from the 1950s to 1970s. But in 1970s and 1990s, there was a requirement for quantitative inspection where the dimensions of the defect need to be characterized. They were needed. And during 1990s to 2010, this characterization gained prominence and measurements were being given adequate importance. And 3D imaging also started coming into picture. 2010 onwards, we saw the evolution of smart and intelligent NDE. And today we are talking about NDE 4.0 in line with industry 4.0. So if you see, it started with physical measurements. It translated to the robustness of the measurements, including giving the inputs to the designers and our fracture mechanics personnel. Then it went on to life-linked high precision in measurements, which can be used for remnant life ass assessment structural health monitoring, etc. In the field of sensors, quite a good amount of technology developments had been made. Today, we have miniature sensors, we have micro, macro and nano sensors, which we are talking about. And we are also talking about wireless sensors integrated with technologies like IoT, which can be used for structural health monitoring. And it has started also. Okay, what are my thoughts? Coherent synergism is a very favorite word for Dr. Chidam Ramsar. In fact, practically every talk of his, you can see that he uses this particular word. Disruptive technologies is a very top, I mean, favorite terminology, which is being used by many technologists today. They primarily refer to the digital technologies, 
that have come into the fore quite unexpectedly getting pushed due to the COVID. I would advocate for coherent synergism of multimodal NDE with the disruptive technologies towards robust quality and enhanced structural health monitoring. Today, one of our main problems is the aging structures which need to be attended to. We need to have robust technologies which are based on all these multimodal approaches which can be used for ensuring that no catastrophes had happened. And if you see here, on one hand, we have the application of NDE technologies in all these areas. And for all these things to be successful, I need to have calibrated equipments and well-qualified and trained personnel, which is very, very important. This is an area which needs to be emphasized and nurtured. And if this is quite, I mean, which is rigorous and robust, I can be very sure that all these things would be quite successful. So this is a very important area to be emphasized with. And what is the need for the other? DAE has been the pioneer as far as non-destructive evaluation is concerned. In fact, I have had the privilege of interacting with peers like Sri Balramurthy, and I have been mentored by none other than Dr. Baldev Raj and late Dr. Chandra, uh, Sri V. A. Chandramoli. And I should place on record because if I am today here talking about NDE, I owe my NDE experience to many of the peers in DAE whom I have mentioned and others which include Sri P. G. Kulkarni of AFD, Dr. Vaidya, who has been considered as an eminent expert as far as radiography is concerned, and Dr. Jose Panakal, who was the first neutron radiography level three in India. Uh, of course, Sri B. K. Shah, who has, I'm, I mean, I always interact and take valuable advices from him, and many others in this particular field who have been there, and they have been responsible for setting all these practices. In fact, Sri Balramurthy Garu used to say that you talk about ISO 9001 and all these Six Sigma, all these things had been practiced by DAE without these sort of concepts being there. And But today, as the department has grown over a number of areas, we have a number of units, we have a number of experts in all these units who have been providing very valuable NDE services to the various mandates. But there needs to be a harmonization of procedure and techniques. What do I mean by this? Let us take, for example, the back and fuel cycle facilities, which are also being done at Kalpakam, which is being done at BRC, which is being done at Tarapur, etc. All these things are being done well, no doubt about it. But if I can have a uniformity with respect to the acceptance criteria, for example, if I have sheets to be fabricated, I have the what you call the inclusion content, or I have the ultrasonic defect thresholds that are to be set, or the procedure to be used, technology to be adopted for the inspection of the plates or the vessels, etc., or the annular tanks, which pose quite a challenge, then it becomes easier for me. Not only that, it would also help. For example, each of us are practicing certain things. In Kalpakam, we were the first to introduce small diameter piping X-ray. And when I had the opportunity to interact with our late chairman, Shibasu, when he was here in PRP also, and subsequently as director BRC in one of the conversations, when I mentioned to him that we are doing this, he said that please send across the document. And again, in many of our earlier cases, gamma radiography used to be employed for the small diameter piping because of the lack of accessibility, etc. Again, they used to use Iridium-192. As per the codes, Iridium-192 is not an appropriate isotope for wall thicknesses of the order of around 4 millimeters or thick millimeters. It is normally recommended above 19 millimeters as per Section 5 code uh, of ASME. Well, so what we thought is we have selenium. So we introduced selenium, which of course today is being practiced by many DA units. But these sort of procedures and techniques, if we have a brainstorming among us 
on these areas, we can compare the procedures and techniques, take the best practices which can be converted as a document by AERB. I should place on record the extensive role of AERB because today, if we are able to use the ionizing radiations quite safely and effectively, it is because of AERB, which has got in very good procedures and ensured its implementation. So these sort of things can be made as a document, which can also get transformed as a standard, first at Indian level and later on at the ISO level, because I have been in ISO committees. There are lack of standards pertaining to the nuclear community, which can definitely be considered here. INS can play a pivotal role. INS has been a forerunner in organizing many unique events for the DAE fraternity. And probably you can consider a workshop on the NDE techniques at, in the reactor and in the back end fuel cycle facilities. The second area is round robin exercises. As I was indicating, we have we need to have calibrated equipments, we need to have trained and certified personnel, and we need to have on document that the probability of detection across the various units is quite uniform. It can be, it can vary depending on the technology that is being adopted. But there is a baseline. In this, in this regard, we need to have again an approach which can definitely be formulated when one has these sort of workshops or uh, international, I mean, a national brainstorming event where we can come up with recommendations to the DAE fraternity on modalities of implementation. The third part I felt is having been in NDE and having a good interaction with the academic community as well as with the various DA units. We can have collaborative focused research, especially on imaging NDE, which is going to form the backbone in the coming years, it is already a backbone for the various core and structure uh, and uh, strategic industries. So in this area, we can have a focus, for, for example, uh, fuel after it is getting irradiated in the reactor, there are a number of thermophysical properties that change. Today, we depend on international literature and limited experimentation. But there are techniques which are available. For example, I have photothermal methods which are being adopted elsewhere, which can be tailored to be used inside the hot cells. To give you an example, if I have a small laser beam impinging on a fuel, it is a high power laser. It is going to cause a localized heating, which is going to perturb the air associated with the fuel pellet. If I pass another laser beam through this air, which is in contact with the fuel pellet, due to the changes in the refractive index, there is going to be a deflection, which can be correlated to the thermal diffusivity of the fuel. This part, I had done it for the aluminum alloys when I was in Saarbrücken as part of Indo-German collaboration. But why not we adopt that to a insel area where I can effectively determine the thermophysical properties as a function of burn up. This can be done by us here. What we can do is we can rope in an industry partner where we can give him our requirements, a optical a partner who is well first with the optical technologies, develop a sort of system which can then be technology transferred and then be used by the industries. It can also be internationally used. This is a typical example. The second example is we do a lot of leak before break criteria. We also subject components to cyclic loading for large number of cycles, one lakh, two lakhs, three lakhs, and see at what after what cycle it breaks. So in this particular area, both infrared thermography and digital image correlation, DIC is a very potential technique that can give me the strain fields in real time. It can be visualized in real time. We have used this at Kalpakam for industrial company, industrial uh, what you call uh, tensile testing, etc. So this, both of these things can be combined together and it can provide a very valuable input to the designers. This can be done in collaboration with institutions like CSIR, where we normally have SERC, etc. 
that such facilities are there. So combined together, we can arrive at a suitable problem, give it to them so that we can, again, these are large scale projects where good amount of, I mean, academic and uh, DAE collaborations can be envis envisaged. Similarly, other area is flow visualization, whether it's a thermal reactor or a fast reactor, cavitation, the flow induced problems is, also, is always an issue. Here again, NDE techniques can be very easy, I mean, uh, versatile, it can be utilized very well. We have done X-ray imaging of the sodium as it is flowing through a tube. And we were able to visualize the bubbles that is being formed. The same thing can be extended to large scale experimental facility, which can be done through a BRNS project involving academic institutions like IITs, etc. We have model examples for that. So these are areas which can come up during such sort of brainstorming discussions where each unit can, I mean, envisage the major, I mean, areas, gray areas that require design input. Similarly, in the area of technology development, equipment development, we depend a lot on imported equipments. Why not design our own? At BRC, we have extensive, what you call expertise in various areas like electronics, instrumentation. At IGCAR, we have certain expertises, say in the area of software development, et cetera, or the application of AI in NDE, which our NDED colleagues has done along with BRC for Tarapur, NPCA. So can we sit together to design equipments, whether it is ultrasonic equipment or for example, computer tomography. Computer tomography is going to be used very widely. We have yet to exploit the full potential of this particular technique, but we need to import. We have crude designs, both at BRC at IG card, but can we refine it and then use it, uh, standardize an equipment and the technology transfer equipment would not only be of use to the NDE community here, but also to all the other industries, the manufacturing industries located across the country. So if we can have a low cost system developed, which is definitely possible with our core and multidisciplinary specialities existing in the various units, I think we can make a mark in this. So these are some of the areas where I thought that definitely INS can play a role can be a body that can bring to the, uh, together all the professionals associated in this particular field. And the spin-offs of all these things would be definitely available to the society at large. And one area today, the government is talking about public-private partnerships. And if you talk of such public-private partnerships, I need to have strong standards focusing on the various nuclear technologies. This is an area where DAE definitely can play a major role because we have a wealth of expertise. And in the past, DAE has been nodal in beauty of Indian standards. Dr. Balram Murthy was one of the first chairman of the MTD committee, non-destructive, um, uh, MTD committee on non-destructive testing section 21, which has been normally chaired by the DAE community. But we need to play a larger role in this and also take it to ISO if we have to make an international benchmark, which can definitely be done. And DAE can be a pioneer in this particular regard. I thought that, okay, I would just tell because, and again, training and certification is a very important aspect. Today, thanks to our peers in this particular field, be it Sri Balramurthy or late Sri V.A. Chandramoli or late Professor Rajagopal of NPCIL, because of these people, the training and certification which has been developed in-house, we could export it to the nation, other national entities and BIS has recognized the national certification board as one of the nodal institutions, which is primarily what you can say, uh, input being given by the DAE community. So training and certification is a very important area where definitely we can play a pivotal role and we should play also because ultimately failures happen because of lack of awareness, lack of expertise and lack of technologies. Even during the COVID period, all of you would be aware that we had had major failures and major 
catastrophes in uh, a fertilizer plant in Andhra, etc., etc. Okay, I have not touched upon the societal applications that have, we have done at IGCAR because, okay, I didn't want to dilute the focus, but one area where I'm very proud to be associated is this particular Nataraja, which has been gifted by the Department of Atomic Energy to CERN in Geneva. And this was completely fabricated by us at a place called Tanjavur near Kumbakonam. You can see here. And the most important part of this is all these were qualified using ionizing radiations. The entire probability was subjected to radiography. The body of the Nataraja was subjected to radiography. The entire thing was subjected to visual inspection, radiography, in-situ metallography, X-ray fluorescence analysis for chemical composition, etc. So this was gifted by DAE to CERN in Nataraja. You just go to website and say Dancing Shiva CERN. You can get beautiful photographs of this. This is the tallest Nataraja that has been made in the world standing majestically at CERN. I would not go into the physical significance on the Ananda Tantava of Nataraja because it's a topic by itself. But just, okay, to CERN is the birthplace of the Big Bang Theory. So the drum signifies sound, the Big Bang Theory. The flame signifies, it the gobbles up everything that comes into it. The universe has black holes. And this probably signifies the cosmos and the Agni or the flames signifies the stars which are in perpetual motion. I don't, and as all of us know, in the Tao of physics, the uh, Brownian motion of the subatomic particles is similar to the Ananda Tandava of Nataraja. This is told in Tao of physics way back in 1934. So here you can see our former chairman, Dr. Anil Kokotkar, handing this over during the handing over ceremony. Well, with this, again, I would like to thank INS for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts. More important, I would like INS to be a body which can bring forward all the NDE professionals within the DAE fraternity. And today we have definitely, we have robust procedures, but then take it to the next level where we can see that DAE continues to be the leader as far as NDE technologies are concerned. Thank you very much. Any questions? You're welcome. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, Dr. Venkatana, this is Manchanda here. I belong yes, to now INS. Originally, I am from Radio Chemistry BRC. Yes, sir. I'm familiar. Yes, sir. We have met, sir. Yeah. So, Dr. Venkatana, first, uh, let me congratulate you for taking a very important responsibility and at a very, very important time when everybody is talking about PFBR. And I'm sure the expertise which you have, it is going to play again a very pivotal role as far as PFBR is concerned. In fact, you have already hinted, you know, a very big vessel, that is sodium uh, container. Already a lot of NDA work uh, has been going on. But my question, basically, what I wanted to uh, say is, so you did mention about some of the NDA work done on the uh, that uh, FBTR fuel pin. Yes, sir. You know, as you may be knowing, this early charge of FBTR fuel pin was made at Radio Metallurgy BRC. Yes. By Dr. Ganguly, and then Ganguly. fuel pin welding was done by Goswami. Yes, sir. And uh, radio chemistry was largely responsible for developing, you know, the all chemical quality control uh, things. Yes. Particularly, you know, I recollect because I was very closely associated with the helium analysis that cover gas, you know. It is a very challenging thing that 2 ml of gas at one atmospheric pressure and you have to prove that is more than 99% pure actually. So we had also done a lot of development work in that connection. But my question is that over the years, I just thought that if you can brief us, how many fuel pins really failed actually because very high burn up has been seen by these fuel pins and whether uh, Anything the cause of failure was carburization or it was only the wells failed actually. I hope my question is clear. 
Yes, sir. Um, let me tell you that the performance of the fuel pins has been excellent. In fact, up to around 1 lakh uh, megawatt days, I had been directly associated with the PIE part of it. And we have observed that we did not have any sort of issues. Even today, I think the fuel performance has been excellent. The failures, if at all, to the best of my knowledge, is probably a few pins, very, very few pins. And the cost has also been analyzed. I Okay, I don't have the slide here. At the radiometallurgy laboratory, probably because of the fuel clad interaction. At, I, to recall the figures, when we did the 25,000 megawatt days fuel pin, the fuel clad gap was of the order of around 100 to 120 microns was available. And as the burn up increased, this slowly got reduced. And even at around 100 to 125 gigawatt days, if I remember right, it was roughly of the order of around 20 to 25 microns were still available. But in these few cases, there was a fuel clad interaction and possibly that was the cause of the failure. But very, very few pins. I, I don't know the exact number, but it must be of the, of the order of about two or three or something like that only has failed. So in that way, the performance has been excellent. Thank you. Uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have Mr. Shah here in this forum. May I now request Good evening, him? Sir. To, yes. May I request him to also add a few comments or any queries which you may like to put forward? Uh, that uh, query is addressed to me? Yes, sir. Mr. Shah. <laughs> Yes. Excellent presentation, Dr. Venkat. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, that last slide, the task ahead, you have very nicely summarized. Uh, in addition to POD, uh, I'll add that uncertainty in floor sizing. Yes. Yes. Also, should be given importance, particularly. When NDE inputs are used for assessing structural integrity. Yes. Yes. So that uncertainty, measurement uncertainty, that is a flaw sizing uncertainty by NDT becomes very, very important. And uh, there is a no standard protocol available. Yes, sir. Everybody follows that code or standard method and gives the result. But suppose flaw size is given as 2 mm and acceptance is 2.1 and if uncertainty is 0.5, so it is not safe. So that uncertainty needs to be quantified. quantified. So maybe that's the only addition I thought. Otherwise, yes, it was an yes, excellent sir. presentation. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks. Yes, sir. Correct, sir. Yes. You're right, sir. Uncertainty plays a crucial role. And yeah. as towards the end of life, when yeah. defects are likely to grow, this is going to play a major role in determining the remnant life also, sir. Right, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any further questions, uh, sir? Um, Mr. Mehta would like to ask something. Yes, sir. Really thankful to you for taking us through all the journey. It's really uh, very satisfying to know the amount of contribution the Department of Atomic Energy has done to the various uh, industries and fields. In your summing up, I like the idea of your uh, um, workshop on the entity. Uh, I think uh, when Dr. Balwar and Some of the workshop at the IG court, as far as I suggested, that the IG car should be a national center for NDD with the support from BARC and NFC. Somehow that idea didn't uh, have taken further, but I still feel that there should be a consortium, IG car. BRC, NFC, 
and other things that come there. One of the concern with the public is anticipating any accident condition. And we should see how NDT can be used in that one there. And that certainly can be done in understanding the residual life, the anticipation of the growth of any defect, and other aspects of that thing. So I feel that the uh, we at INS we certainly look seriously into the workshop of NDT, where we will need your help very extensively. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Any further questions from anyone? Okay, in the absence of any further questions, I'd like to once again take this opportunity to thank Dr. Venkatraman for the in-depth exposition of the entire gamut of applications of ionizing and non-ionizing radiations in the non-destructive evaluation of nuclear fuels, components, and systems. The pioneering contributions and expertise of DAE in the use of these techniques has been very comprehensively articulated by Dr. Venkatraman in this presentation. The adaptation of radiography, thermal imaging, and applications in Indian art and sculpture have been especially noteworthy contributions. The takeaways from this webinar, in my view, is the key role played by NDA techniques in all parts of the nuclear fuel cycle. Application of ND has led to qualifying components, enhancing safety, and extending the lifetimes of nuclear power plants. This has a direct bearing on the economics of nuclear energy production, which is of great importance for the growth of the nuclear energy sector. He has also provided a very good roadmap for the future, which requires serious consideration. Uh, with these concluding remarks, now I'd like to request Mr. Malhotra to come forward and propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ramana Murthy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Swapnesh Malhotra, Secretary INS, and it is my great pleasure to propose a vote of thanks for the fifth INS webinar, which you just witnessed. First and foremost, I am grateful to Dr. B. Venkatraman, the recently appointed Director IGCAR, and of course, otherwise known to us for decades, for a very informative webinar on applications of ionizing and non-ionizing radiation in NDE. I think all of you will agree that as always, he made an impactful and authoritative presentation on the subject. And sir, as was mentioned by you, and also just now in his concluding remarks, our president, Dr. Uh, Mr. Mehta mentioned, uh, we will take your suggestion very seriously and definitely in the coming months, whenever INS restarts its program of technical workshops, we will take up NDE as a subject and as already suggested by you, not only workshop, maybe some other collaborative projects in this field. Next, I would like to express my gratitude to the recently rejuvenated INS webinar committee with Dr. A. Ramarao as the convener for resuming the webinar series after a pause of about four months. Next, I am thankful to President INS Sri S.K. Mehta for his guidance and encouragement, Dr. V.K. Manchanda, Vice President INS, for his role in restarting the webinar series, including procurement of WebEx for the purpose. I am also thankful to Treasurer Shri G.D. Mittal and in fact the entire Executive Committee of INS for their active contribution and role in resuming the webinar series and other activities of INS. Special thanks are due to Dr. Ramana Murthy. Raja Ramanna Fellow at DAE for introducing the speaker 
and summarizing the presentation made by the speaker. I also thank Shri Anurag Sharma from HBNI and Shri Shimichit Raj Gopal from BARC for their technical help with respect to WebEx and poster preparation for the webinars. Last but not the least, I express my gratitude to all of you for your active participation. Any webinar cannot be successful without active participation of a dynamic audience. Now that was the vote of thanks, but before stopping, I would like to inform you about our forthcoming sixth INS webinar, which is scheduled on 18th September 2021 at 17 hours. The webinar will be delivered by Professor Sandeep Trivedi, former director TIFR, who will speak on the topic, the accelerating universe and its consequences. Kindly join in large numbers with your colleagues and friends. With this, I thank all of you and signing off, Jai Hind. Jai Hind, thank you. You are closing it, or should I close it? Okay, so the webinar is uh, now closed. So let us uh, meet on uh, in the next webinar, as I already announced on 18th September. Thank you very much once again. Bye-bye. See you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Uh, not more than 50.